Well, thank you so many of you uh, for joining us tonight. Um, so we're gonna get started. Um, I'm Marcy Kwan. I'm assistant professor of art history here at Stanford. And I'm co-director of the Asian American Art Initiative. Uh, and I'm Lisa Alexander, um, assistant curator of American art at the Cantor and also co-director of the Asian American Art Initiative. Welcome everyone. Yeah, so um, thank you again for joining us. Um, and we wanna begin today by acknowledging something that many of you are likely painfully aware of which is the recent spate of violence against Asian American elders in the Bay Area and California. According to Stop AAPI Hate, there were more than 1,200 self-reported instances of assault and harassment in California between March and December of last year. Um, we encourage you all to visit their site um, to learn more or if you need to report an incident. Um, so the event today will run as follows. Um, I will begin by speaking for about 15 minutes um, about the genesis and structure of the Asian American Art Initiative, as well as our future research plans. Um, after that, Elisa will speak for about 15 minutes about collecting and exhibitions, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. And if you have questions as we're going, um, because we're in the webinar format, um, if you could just drop them in the chat, that'd be great. When I first began thinking about how to introduce the AAAI, um, I kept on coming back to this painting by Martin Wong, quite appropriate for the new year, um, and a generous gift from the Martin Wong Foundation to the Cantor. A spectacular dragon rears against a glowing cobalt sky. Two children are tucked to the side, their bodies outlined in the same threads of gold that pick out the dragon's scales and face, giving definition to the fleshy mass of its nose and mouth. As art historian Mark Dean Johnson has shared with me, um, Wong's Chinatown paintings from the early 1990s are often done from the perspective of his childhood self, for he grew up on the outskirts of San Francisco Chinatown. So in early 2016, just weeks after I found out I'd be moving to Stanford in the fall, I visited a retrospective of Martin's work at the Bronx Museum. And these are not pictures from the Bronx show, um, but scenes from Martin at shows of his Chinatown paintings um, in New York and San Francisco. Um, Martin died of AIDS-related complications in 1999. His paintings ground extravagant fantasies in urban grit. They are dense tapestries of references that honor all that is fantastic, strange, and singular about this world. After seeing the show, I promised myself I would teach the courses I always wanted to see as a student, chief among them one on Asian American art. As I put together the syllabus for this class, um, the first class I ever taught at Stanford, um, I was astonished by the sheer amount of art and scholarship I had never encountered as an undergraduate or a graduate student. One of the luxuries of being an art historian is encountering a work in person, being in the presence of an object that concretizes what it means to be alive at a particular moment in time in a particular body. Yet because of many issues, institutional racism, chief among them, it remains very difficult to have this kind of encounter with Asian American art and artists beyond a single piece by a handful of canonical artists. I began to dream about building a collection at the Cantor where students, researchers, and the community could do just this. For me, this project has never been about visibility within an institution or academic discourse. Rather, it's about how we care for these artists in the best way we know how, by preserving their work in archives and engaging their very, pra their very practices with rigor and sensitivity. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky to be doing this with Elisa, um, who is just an absolutely brilliant scholar and curator. So perhaps the most common question we get about the AAI is, what do you mean by Asian American? A tricky one. 
So as many of you likely know, the term Asian American was created in the late 1960s as part of the broader Third World Liberation Front in the Bay Area, the student movement against American imperialism and colonial violence. The Third World Liberation Front was, of course, also the advent of what we now call ethnic studies. In other words, from its inception, the term Asian American was at once political and connoted inter-ethnic and international solidarity. We wanna preserve these connotations while also exploring its complications, including all those artists working before the advent of the term. Like Wong's dragon, which is of course a puppet, Asian American is a constructed designation that maintains a real presence in people's lives. The geographic expansiveness of Wong's work, which stretches not only from coast to coast, but also beyond America itself. Um, he told Margot Machida um, that his interest in this particularly luminous shade of cobalt had to do with the way it was used in Chinese painting, um, is a touchstone for the way we're trying to understand the term. In other words, we understand Asian American as a, as a capacious designation rather than a technology of enclosure connoting South, Southeast, East Asia and the Pacific Islands, as well as a multitude of experiences of movement and displacement. We are using the term to focus people's attention on the people, work, practices and ways of being that have remained occluded because of white supremacy and institutional racism. So our work is indebted to a number of scholars who have been unfailingly generous with us. Art historians, Mark Dean Johnson and Margo Machida, who just won co the College Art Association's uh, Award for Excellence and Diversity, congratulations, Margo, um, have been doing this work for decades and they're actually um, both true heroes of mine. The AAI is unthinkable and indeed impossible without their precedent. Together with Gordon Chang, um, Mark, authored the first textbook on Asian American art, whose research files are actually at Stanford. Um, and this is just an example of one of like <laughs> so much um, a richness that are in these files. Um, these are from uh, the files of Irene Poon um, showing um, an array of artists, Ruth Asawa in the middle, but Kei Sakamaki, Benjamin Chen, Carlos Villa, among many others, um, all posing. You can see Irene is actually um, traced and labeled all of them. And, you know, this to me is in some ways a, a constellation akin to the masks um, that Elisa will be talking about soon. So Gordon and Mark are both advisors to the AAI, as is Vanessa Cam, head librarian at the Bose Art and Architecture Library. Vanessa has been a true, um, yeah, like hero as well. Um, instrumental in acquiring the archives of artists, including James Leong and Bernice Bing, as well as attendant documentation um, having to do with Cantor's acquisition. So our acquisitions are often accompanied by archival material um, to deepen research. Uh, we're also incredibly grateful above all to the members of the Bay Area Asian American community who've been just astonishing in their generosity and support. So in terms of um, present and future plans, um, I'm gonna show you this you know, really ugly PowerPoint slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not very good at PowerPoint, um, which gives you a sense of um, the research and, ed and education program. Um, so Elisa and I are co-directors of the AAI um, and she focuses on exhibitions and collections while I'm kind of focusing on the research and education component. So in terms of current plans, um, we're looking at a fall 2022 exhibition, which Elisa will talk about momentarily. And I'm planning a um, symposium in conjunction with that exhibition, um, which will bring together scholar, scholars, artists, um, and community members, um, as well as public figures uh, to rethink and reimagine Asian American art and aesthetics. Elisa and I are both um, guest editing a special issue of the journal Panorama um, Asia, on Asian American art past and futures. This is the journal of the historians of American art, um, which will be out in summer of 2021. Um, 
We're also both contributing essays to a special issue of American Art edited by um, the art historian Shipu Wang um, from 2022. Um, Elisa will be writing about Bernice Bing and I'll be writing about um, Jade Snow Wong. And one thing I'm particularly excited about um, in conjunction with Stanford Libraries um, and PPOW Gallery, um, we are currently working on an online catalog raisonné of Martin Wong's paintings, um, which has just been so fun to work on and um, astonishing in what, has, what I've learned about him. Um, hundreds and hundreds of paintings. Um, and Stanford Libraries has just been an incredible, um, an incredible collaborator on this. And we're really grateful for their support. Um, and Vanessa um, and Mark are instrumental in this project. And Vanessa has really been uh, the key kind of point person on this. Um, and then finally, you know, I realized after um, really teaching the Asian American art class for several years and doing some writing that I actually have a book pretty much on artists from San Francisco Chinatown, which I'm working on right now. So to come, um, I plan to turn my Asian American art survey course into a kind of research lab. Um, as Elisa will talk about, there's just so much work to be done um, in simply ascertaining the basic facts about some of our acquisitions, um, doing research about the body of acquisitions. Um, and so I'm working on how to you know, think about turning this course into a lab for undergraduates to begin to start doing this research and contributing to this history. Um, we're also hoping to plan a series of research workshops with artists and scholars and uh, especially community members, because we recognize, of course, that the communities that these artists were a part of are um, the ones who knew them the best, you know, and we want to um, try to think about how to conduct research that would be more, more um, or less hierarchical than, you know, the scholar coming in and, 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 you know, kind of true collaborative relationship to do the kind of work we want to do on these, on these artists. Um, along with this, um, we're thinking about expanded public programming and community engagement, um, as well as digital scholarship and documentation, um, just so everyone will have access to these works. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Elisa um, to give you a sense of the exhibition and collections. Um, thank you so much, Marcy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be working and to have been able to work on this project with you for the last two and a half years um, to help you to help us both realize that dream that you had about an Asian American art collection. Uh, and I'm really, really heartened by the number of attendees that we have here tonight, almost 180, I think, which really speaks to the interest um, in the topic, which of course gets us both really excited. Um, you know, Marcy has been working on this project since she came to Stanford four years ago, four or five years ago. And when I started two and a half years ago at the Cantor, I knew that um, part of my job as the assistant curator of American art would be to work with Marcy on this project. And it's one of the major reasons I wanted to come here. Um, similar to Marcy, I was, I never had access to courses um, in undergrad or graduate school on Asian American art. So it, it was not my course of study uh, for my PhD, but, um, but it's something that through, you know, going through doing this work, like actually doing this work for the ground up, of course, has become extremely important to me. And I think both Marcy and I want to provide platforms uh, and modes of engagement on this history that we didn't have access to. And frankly, we are not that old. We should have been able to have access to this type of material um, when we were in graduate school. But that tells you something about um, the way that American art history has been constructed in institutions. So um, I wanted to start by a wonderful, with a wonderful quote by the amazing, of course, Margot Machida um, that she writes in 1990, uh, in this exhibition catalog that at present, no museum scale setting is exclusively devoted to reflecting the richness and diversity of contemporary visual arts emanating from our numerous Asian national communities and generational groups, each with separate traditions, beliefs, and immigrant histories. 
the development of such institutions would correspond to those alternative spaces and museums that have been so successful promoting other American ethnic and racial groups. She goes on to say, heating precedents like the Studio Museum in Harlem, we must establish and support Asian American structures that not only ensure visibility and survival for our cultural base, but also perpetuate its growth and importance within American society. So um, I, in thinking about that quote and in thinking about how there is still currently no uh, institution that is exclusively devoted in a historical manner to um, the collection and display of Asian American art, what can Stanford, what can the Cantor do um, to address this gap and this lack that continues? Uh, of course, there is, I just wanted to call out, of course, there's the amazing virtual Asian American Art Museum um, that's run by the APA, but uh, as much as we have all been really experiencing the, um, the wonders and benefits of virtual programming and virtual museums during the pandemic, there is something to be said about building a physical structure or infrastructure for the kind of project that Marcy and I seek to do. And I'll explain a little bit um, in the coming slides what I mean by that and why I feel like this project, the AAAI, can only happen not only at a museum, but at a university art museum and why it needs um, this kind of space and access to resources and scholarly community um, to do what we're looking to do. Uh, in thinking about Asian American art at Stanford, just some facts, around 23% of Stanford undergraduates, 14% of graduate students, and 47% of Cantor visitors identify as being Asian descent. Um, so there is a certain argument to be made there. There is an established research, research precedent at Stanford that Marcy has already highlighted. You know, Marcy um, is one among quite a few, quite many, including Gordon Chang, who's here. Um, nice to see you, Gordon, uh, who have been working on this for a long time. It's really important to both Marcy and I to acknowledge that what we're trying to do here could not be done without the foundation that has been laid by folks like Gordon and Mark Johnson, who have been instrumental in helping us get the AAAI off the ground. Uh, as I mentioned, the only academic institution with a center devoted to Asian American art um, is at NYU, and it focuses primarily on contemporary art. Um, and we, both Marcy and I, are really invested in this history, in the long history of uh, Asian presence and Asian diaspora in the United States. And finally, the Cantor is, um, to the best of its ability, an encyclopedic museum. So I think that having an initiative like this contained within the model and rubric of an encyclopedic institution is an interesting um, proposition, a challenge in its own right, but so it does make a statement about this larger history um, within the museum context and within an academic context. So how to do this? So I'm explaining to you, I just wanted to share with everyone the way that um, I, have set out to kind of organize my work and execute uh, my side of it. As Marcy mentioned, Marcy does um, the research, the teaching, the uh, academic programming, and I do the curatorial program at the Cantor um, for the AAAI. And that means a lot of different things. And so in this first phase, especially, acquisitions are very important because if you want to have um, an initiative centered around Asian American art, it's pretty helpful to have a collection of work by Asian American artists. Uh, and we had um, some works already at the Cantor prior to my arrival, but nothing that would necessarily make us a research center. We need the raw material, right, to get the AAAI going. And with that raw material, um, we can then begin to think about putting together a variety of exhibitions from rotating permanent collection installations, special temporary shows, and special artist commissions. Uh, we are also at present exploring the possibility eventually of a dedicated gallery space um, or a permanent gallery at the Cantor specifically focused on Asian American art. And there are arguments um, both for and against the idea of a, a uh, culturally, spe culturally specific galleries within museum spaces. You could say we can just, we should just assimilate it into the American art collection and that is the best route forward. Or we can um, highlight it or separate it out and put it in its own gallery. 
So there's a lot at stake in terms of thinking about how one wants to present the material that we are currently acquiring. And then finally, uh, collaborative projects like the symposium that Marcy mentioned, um, the, guest, uh, the guest edited portion of Panorama that her and I are putting together. So these are the other components um, to the curatorial program of just getting uh, the word and the work out there. In my mind, I uh, needed to come up with a kind of strategy to how to create a collection because when I arrived, um, it was just sort of like, well, now we will try to build a collection of Asian American art. And how was one going to do that? Um, it, you know, it's something that requires a lot of thought and strategy. And again, I had endless support from the larger community, who, um, Bay Area arts community and beyond who have long been invested in this material and their support has been so necessary um, because a lot of it is a kind of investigative detective-like research in order to get this done. So these are the, the different ways that I approached looking at objects. Um, tactic one, which is looking at canonical artists. Um, as you can imagine, the, the, um, the blue chip canonical artists of uh, the Asian diaspora, it's rather small and um, there are not that many folks who are well known, especially in the public sphere. But we wanted to make sure that those who were known were represented in the collection. And so I will talk about that further. Um, most artists really fall under tactic two. Most artists of Asian descent working in the United States, they are historically significant, but often underrecognized artists. They, um, you know, or many of them are under threat of being lost to, I don't know, you know the destruction of archives, um, to just not having institutional presence, right? Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that the historical component um, was really recognized in the collection and not just the contemporary. Uh, tactic three, you know, there is a reason why we are doing this at Stanford, why we are doing this in the Bay Area, why in California. And um, so we wanted to make sure that the Asian diaspora, artists of the Asian diaspora in California are very represented in the collection as well. And finally, as Marcy said, um, we have, Stanford has an amazing, uh, amazing holdings and special collections, um, archives already present, like the papers of Ruth Asawa and Martin Wong and Bernice Bing. Um, and we want to make sure that if you want to go conduct research at the library on an artist, that the Cantor will also have a complementing body of work for you to physically go look at while you are doing your research. And so this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I say it's really imperative that we have the triple AI happen at a university and a university art museum. So. Let's get to the art. Let's get to the actual art that we've been able to um, acquire thus far. So of course, uh, the most major, well, one of them, I don't, I don't want to play favorite. So one, the, one of the most major acquisitions of the AAAI thus far is this amazing, amazing um, piece, Ruth Asawa's Wall of Masks, which are comprised of 233 ceramic masks. Um, and Ruth Asawa, of course, is one of the most well-known Asian American artists um, uh, in the history of American art. And while we did, do have her work uh, in the Cantor collection, this piece, when it was brought to me, um, I just felt was such an amazing living archive document record of her presence in the Bay Area. Uh, I think it's really important to remember that for a lot of these artists, they were also arts advocates and leaders and community members, and that was essential to their artistic practice. And so this is, each of these masks are um, impressions of her friends, family members, other artists, um, other cultural workers, other arts advocates uh, in the Bay Area. So you can really see who she was interacting with, um, her students, for example, as well. And uh, Ruth was an amazingly well-connected um, and generous individual. And I think that that's really reflected in this piece. And so um, all of the masks have now been transported to the Cantor, which is very exciting. And um, they're in the building. And, you know, like I said, since we have Asawa's papers, this will make a, such an amazing opportunity to conduct really wonderful research uh, about who's represented. There is an Excel sheet that um, identifies uh, to the best of the state's ability who's who. Um, within this work, which is really exciting. So this is um, one of the major acquisitions. 
And here she describes the process and this amazing archival photo of her um, doing this activity in the classroom with young folks. Of course, you make um, an impression or you, you do the first with um, plaster, you make a plaster cast, and then you take from that and you do the clay impression. And here are some examples uh, of the individual masks. She uses all different clay bodies, which are all sort of different, interestingly different skin tones, right? Um, on, uh, in this object. A little behind the scenes photos here. This is the photographer, John Gutman. Um, the second and uh, really, really important um, part of this first set of acquisitions, I want to stress that the acquiring hasn't stopped, of course, this is really just the beginning, but we really wanted to build a foundation um, before we brought the AAAI out into the world. And one major component of that is establishing a historical collection, which um, Michael Brown really had um, an unparalleled collection of work by artists who were of Asian descent working in California. Um, the, we had been in touch with um, Michael uh, since I had arrived and then sadly he passed away in late 2019. Um, but we continued to work with the estate. He was a Bay Area arts dealer and collector and of course always wanted to see this work in museums, in a museum. He collected it because he believed it was um, an amazing body of work that was really underrepresented in American history and he, he you know, um, was a boots on the ground kind of person and out there finding this amazing wealth of material um, that uh, hadn't really been collected very much. And so um, some more behind the scenes action. We uh, went, um, a Cantor team, you know, I had visited the, uh, the unit a couple of times um, and I had a lot of advice, especially from Mark Johnson on the selection of works because there were hundreds and hundreds of amazing works. Um, and it's so hard to know, right, um, how to build a history. Uh, and so with that knowledge, with the research that was done, um, a Cantor crew and I went in July and we brought uh, 141 objects back to the museum. And so now these objects, um, are also in the building and it's really such a tremendous thing to see how you know just works like these these are the earliest works in the collection from 1880 and 1895 a really change your understanding of the history of American art I know that if I would have seen these works in an undergraduate lecture on the topic that it really would have changed my perspective on what was being done um, and so, uh, you know, Michael's collection is invaluable in terms of um, its historical value. And so we are so lucky to have 141 objects in addition to the Ruth Asawa as part of the collection. And of course, as Marcy so beautifully spoke about the Martin Wong, which was a gift from the Martin Wong Foundation, um, this jade, these Jade Fan Wu watercolors of San Francisco Chinatown that are from the Michael Brown collection beautifully complement um, this other pre-existing work in the collection. And uh, in addition to that, we acquired 25 amazing photographs from the San Francisco photographer, Michael Jang, from his family series, The Jangs, which he took in 1973 during a summer course with Lizette Modell. And it's just these really wonderful, quirky, idiosyncratic uh, snapshots of his family in Pacifica. Um, and they are really just humorous and full of fun. The right, I apologize for the terrible image quality, um, but that is because what you're looking at is a Bernice Bing painting that was in storage um, that was gifted to us from the estate of Bernice Bing, and it is under plastic, so uh, that's, well, that's what you see there. Um, and so we are really so happy to have the work of Bernice Bing, who is such, like Asawa, such a prominent um, arts advocate and organizer and community member in the Bay Area, and a wonderful painter, um, and we did not previously have any of her work in the collection, which leads me to, you know, a lot of this work that Marcy and I are doing um, is really uh, going to people's homes. It's pulling archives out of garages. This is the archive of Bernice Bing that Vanessa Cam and I brought to Stanford Libraries. Um, it's real, 
work, I don't know if there are young people or students on this call, but sometimes I think historical work and what you're actually doing or curatorial work can seem rather abstract, that you're just working inside these large institutions um, on your computer, just, you know, uh, and that's the extent of it. But a lot of it is you're out there, you're really trying to find the physical materials of history and bring it back for safekeeping. And so we were so, I was so excited and personally touched um, to be able to bring Bernice, to help Vanessa bring Bernice Bing's archive to Stanford. And of course we want this to be one of many. And so I wanna leave with a question and um, this is just a SketchUp model of um, works by Asian American artists that we had in the collection prior to all of these things that I just discussed. This is what we already had. And I want to think about um, what it would mean to dedicate a gallery space specifically for the history of Asian American art within a museum setting. Uh, like Marcy said, there will be a launch exhibition for the AAAI that will happen in fall of 2022. So all these amazing acquisitions, all this work that um, has been going on, as much as that has been work, the real work starts now in putting together this exhibition that will come very soon in museum time um, and will feature a lot of this material that I've uh, just acquired. But we both really want to stress that this is not kind of, um, this, this isn't just a one-time thing. This is ongoing work. We're trying to plan for the long term. We're trying to strategize now um, how to build a project that really involves the community as well that really um, has lots of voices and stakeholders because we're doing this, um, not just for us, we're doing this because we want others to have access to this type of material that again, we really didn't have access to. So this event is really, um, it truly is a launch event because it is just the beginning for a larger project and series of projects to come. And uh, please look out for um, in spring of 2021, June of 2021, this special guest edited issue of Panorama by Marcy and myself. Um, thank you so much, uh, Elisa. Every time I see <laughs> that presentation, it's like really, really, really exciting. Um, so um, I'd like to invite people, please, to just once again, uh, drop any questions you have in the chat. Um, we are here and open. Um, and uh, I will field uh, the first question by Hannah Dow. Um, so how does the initiative plan to foster opportunities for undergraduates and graduates? Will it other feature Asian American student artists at Stanford? It's a good question. Um, so in terms uh, of undergraduate research, I really think that um, I'm going to try to transform um, my Asian American art lecture course, which is an, a course I teach every year, um, as I mentioned, into a kind of laboratory for student research. Um, you know, kind of teaching you all um, how to, you know, use these archival collections, put them in relationship to the works of art. Like this is actually in, in, in large part, like what I was imagining um, when I was thinking about these resources. And, and as I mentioned, you know, um, we have big plans, but we're really hoping that um, we'll have a larger digital presence to actually, you know, show you like have high high res images and information on um, so many of the works that we've acquired. Um, you know, the Michael Brown collection being the biggest kind of um, a task at hand, and I'm really hoping um, students in that course will contribute to that. And so it will really be like almost like a hands on practicum um, for graduate students. Um, I think that we don't want to hire you without paying you. <laughs> so we're um, still, we're like putting together some kind of funding um, or we're trying to put together some funding um, in order to um, make this available to all of you. Um, and to, because it is, it's more work really than like Elise and I can do alone or like anyone can do alone. It's gonna, it's like, and as many of you know, the more research you do, the more it expands out and you're like, oh my God, I have, it, it just like multiplies. So I think that, um, yeah, we just like need all your help. <laughs> and in terms of student artists, I actually, um, for the Asian American art class, I do have a, um, a component, uh, you know, students always have an, an option in terms of their assignments, their final assignments. And one of the options is a creative one. So, um, over the past few years, I've gotten like 
absolutely astounding works of art from my students um, in that course. That's just been like really, really fun. Um, and so I think it's a good question about like how we can, you know, perhaps collect or, um, you know, make those, those works available. So stay tuned. Awesome. Well, I'm going to condense a couple of questions here from Roland Fusu and uh, Carol Harlow. So the first is, what is involved in making a gallery space for the AAAI at the Cantor, and what are the chances this can happen? Um, and the second is, when and where will the artwork, especially Asawa's mask, uh, be located in the museum? Which is a question I get all the time. Um, so, you know, the interesting thing about museums and museum work um, that I'm always very um, passionate about, about kind of demystifying this for general public so that you understand some of the things that are at play when you walk into a museum space um, are things like gallery restrictions, for example, when a gallery is named, as there are many named galleries at the Cantor, often that comes with a restriction on what type of art and how long it can be shown in that space. So we are currently in the process of looking through our namespaces and our unnamed spaces at the museum um, and thinking about what is possible uh, in terms of um, really visualizing a permanent gallery space. At the moment, we're also really focused on the launch exhibition and maybe doing a series of smaller rotations throughout the museum um, so that it's not static, something that is moving and changing and that allows us to showcase as much work as possible. So we're really in the kind of nuts and bolts planning phase of what is it that we can physically do within our space. Um, of course, if we had a generous donor who came to us and said, I, will, I would like to name a gallery space specifically for Asian American art at the Cantor, that would make a compelling argument uh, in part to help make that happen. Um, related to these upcoming exhibitions, when and where will the artwork be shown? Uh, again, we are in the process of um, talking through that with the staff. We have a beautiful uh, gallery that we use for um, our feature rotating exhibitions. So the Michael Brown works and a lot of these works that I have shown in fall of 2022 will be in Friedenrich Gallery, um, which is, I think, the nicer space in the museum. <laughs> Uh, the Asawa masks are fascinating and we have quite a number of options. And so the things that I'm weighing in my mind are um, what kind of space and environment do I want to create for viewers when they look at these masks? Do I want it to be in a big open space um, that is a major throwaway of the museum? Do I want it to create this kind of immersive, really contemplative environment? Um, for the masks, um, you know, I'm trying to weigh through these questions and think about um, what is actually possible with the staff. So the masks are um, to be determined at present and we will do our best to perhaps install them before fall of 2022. It just depends on, you know, what we're able to do at the small and mighty museum that is the Cantor with our wonderful staff. Uh, and so stay tuned um, because we have received a lot of attention and a lot of interest and, you know, we want to make sure it gets out there soon, but we also really want to do it right. So. Thanks. Um, so I will also combine a couple of questions which have to do with um, resources, uh, syllabi, but also people who are interested in learning more. Thank you uh, to, I believe, Paul N, or N Paul and uh, Sarah Magnata for these questions. Um, and uh, what I'll say is, you know, for anyone looking to learn more, I would absolutely start with um, Margo Machida and Mark Dean Johnson's work. Um, Mark and Gordon, we've already mentioned their Asian American art of history is just like, it is like, <laughs> every time I go back to that book, it like astounds me again, because um, there are these like capsule, um, like biographies and like kind of bibliographies and things in the back. It's just like an unbelievable and unparalleled resource. Um, and uh, Margot's Unsettled Visions um, from Duke University Press is like, a, you know, a foundational text in the field. Um, in terms of syllabi, I mean, it's a great idea. I think that this is exactly the type of thing we're thinking about, you know, making um, resources for teaching, for example, available to uh, K-12 or to other college instructors. Like this is this is the kind of thing we're thinking about in terms of this next phase of um, uh, specifically, you know, not just what um, we can produce like research wise, but how we um, 
yeah, how we make it as, as broadly accessible as possible. So, um, so thank you for those, those questions and suggestions. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Marcy. Uh, question from Joy, question that I love to see. Is there a specific list of funding needs and opportunities that would help advance AAAI's work on all fronts? Um, yes, there is. We're, uh, we're sort of the process, ongoing process of um, identifying and describing those different areas. Um, something that really we, that always, and especially with Asian American art, because a lot of this artwork um, sadly was not able to really be cared for um, to the, you know, to the greatest advantage during an artwork's lifetime is conservation. So, um, we have been acquiring a lot of works of art and this is amazing and wonderful, but something that get, can kind of get dropped off in the process is funding to conserve the works that we do end up getting into the collection. So um, we will hopefully be working on a specific and dedicated fund um, just for that, because um, for example, the Bernie Spring <coughs> that we have also requires some significant conversation or conservation. Um, and so this is a, this is a real need. You can always support exhibitions um, and acquisitions and conservation. And um, Marcy, do you have anything to add? That yeah, part? special collections. Um, Vanessa's been doing just an amazing, Vanessa Cam um, has been doing an amazing job, but I think that um, there's always a need for, um, you know, dedicated funds for special collections and including processing and acquisitions. So I would love, um, I'd love some of that to happen because she's really been doing it on what she has available to her. Yeah. And, um, you know, Stanford has, of course, um, helped us uh, in this, supported us in this regard, but this is such a big and large and ongoing project that it's going to require um, long-term uh, investment. And I mean, investment in, you know, a myriad of ways uh, from, people on many fronts. Um, so it's something that's definitely a need for us. Yes. Um, so uh, a couple of questions actually from, from current and former students. Um, uh, Marcelo asks about um, the Martin Wong papers um, and the collection we're getting um, because there is a repository of his papers at NYU. And actually um, that collection that we're receiving um, from the foundation um, is the collection that was held by Martin's mother, Florence. Um, and she, I mean, it's like, it almost like made me cry to see um, just like the incredibly detailed list <laughs> of exhibitions and like, and like the documentation that she kept of Martin's work, you just, um, like, yeah, you just feel something really palpable and how, um, how much they cared for each other. Um, and so she has, so there are like several boxes of, um, of her records of Martin's career that are coming to us. Um, and then Viv, um, Viv Liu, um, who's currently at the Asian Art Museum um, and will be contributing to the Martin Wong Catalog Raisonne, um, asked the very good question about the AAI's relationship to the dedicated Asian art gallery, galleries in the curatorial department um, and collection at the, at the Cantor. Um, and, I'll let um, Elisa handle the kind of canter side of that. Um, but what I'll say is that, you know, there is currently no, um, we do not have an Asian art curator. And so that is a kind of an open question for us. But um, I think Elisa and I are both really interested in the ways um, that Asian American art necessarily has to move beyond the boundaries, um, the confines of the nation state, right? As, as a, a dedicated model of analysis um, by its very, uh, nature. And so I think that, um, I think that absolutely the Asian collections should be an important resource for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but we need to carry it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's on our mind for sure. It's yeah. a really important um, gap that we are looking to fill because I would love and I need a collaborator of <laughs> Asian art at the Cantor. Um, because as Marcy said, we look at this term we treat this term with the broadest possible scope. And so for example, um, you can have work that is made by an artist who would maybe you not, you wouldn't consider to be Asian American per se, like Ai Weiwei, but you know, who's like spent significant amount of time in the States and 
you know, what work he did make in the States, could we classify that as Asian American? Same thing goes for Kusama. Um, and it's really, I mean, artists are sometimes, but really not always bounded by borders. So we are really invested in looking at the broader Asian diaspora and movement and really cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, this is not a project that, again, really should be bound by this idea of the nation state. Yeah, and and again, it's um, it's about it's about direct using the term to direct attention as opposed to using it to classify or consolidate, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's like um, Ai Weiwei, you know, spent like '90s in New York, and like that's really important to his practice. I think that's so interesting and important to talk about in relation to this stuff. Um, and so. Um, yeah, uh, I will, or Elisa, I guess it's your turn for to, uh, to ask, to field a question. <laughs> um, this is a question about uh, contemporary Asian American art, basically generating dialogue and working with Asian American contemporary artists. Um, I love working with live and collaborating with living artists. Uh, and I look forward to doing that um, in the near future. I think, like I had mentioned during my presentation, it was just really important for Marcy and I to to reach back and lay the historical groundwork for what we mean when we say Asian American art in order to um, really think about this long history. And now with that collection in mind, something that I think would be really interesting to explore and do is to perhaps invite an amazing Asian American artist to come look at the historical artworks that the Cantor has now um, collected and maybe we can put something together where they use that as resource material or perhaps they curate something or they make work based off of our collection and really engage um, an artist in that way. You know, we had the artist Mark Dion do this incredible installation of this, our Stanford family collections where he went through the materials of um, the Stanford family that we have in the museum and he created the Melancholy Museum, which is really a wonderful immersive um, work of art and also exhibition uh, in our gallery. So it would be wonderful to think about how would we do that with our Asian American collection. Yeah. Um, so the next question comes from Hannah Dow. Um, the AAI comes at a moment when there is rising racial tensions in the country. Will the initiative also be working closely with Asian American Studies program of the Center for Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity. Um, so I'm affiliated faculty with both of them. Um, and so yes, my courses are always cross-listed um, in both. And I see, um, and, and I wanna say that Jen Brody from CCSRE has been an incredible supporter. Um, and so we absolutely feel that, um, I mean, it's 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 an interesting question because it 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 just feels like it's so it's so present and natural um, that because because I kind of have feet in in both programs um, that this is in some ways like a CCSRE type of of thing as well. But I think that um, what you're probably asking is about like specifically issues of Asian American racialization and um, and you know questions about um, you know continuing anti-Asian violence, xenophobia, and white supremacy. Um, and certainly, um, I think that, you know, our project, um, you can't not speak about those things when you're speaking about this work. It just shaped, it's there in the artist's work, right? Um, and so absolutely, um, those perspectives are gonna be crucial um, and are crucial um, moving forward as we continue to um, conduct research and put together these narratives. Great. Um, so question here uh, related to acquisitions. Are we collecting historical flyers, posters, documents, and other historical context behind the artwork? Um, the answer is yes. When it's specifically related to the object, we love to have that in the museum. But if not, um, special collections, again, with Vanessa Cam, this is material that would um, be of interest there as well, because those kinds of materials are really important and they're the things that are left behind in history that uh, really help researchers do the necessary work and get things done. And it's one of, um, it's one of my favorite parts is looking through all of that material. Um, and it really gives you a sense of the richness beyond just the wonderful and amazing individual art objects, but everything else that was going on time. Um, so yes, this is why libraries are important. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, so I am kind of scrolling through questions. I think we've gone through a lot of them. Um, oh, there's one about uh, South Asia and whether India is in your scope. Um, I think absolutely, you know, we, um, uh, the Michael Brown collection um, is, to my knowledge, is, is there a Zarina? There... Um, there is not. Okay, he, so. His strength was East, but. Yeah. Um... So I think that it's definitely something um, absolutely that um, is, is crucial to the story we're telling. Um, and, you know, we really hope to collaborate with places like the Center for South Asia um, at Stanford. Um, in terms of, um, you know, building up this competency um, as well as this area. Um, I'm trying to find a link here, yeah. but um, there's a question about a newsletter that provides updates. Yes, there is a AAAI mailing list um, and I'm trying to find the link to drop it in the chat for you. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think that, um, let me see if there's any more questions. Yeah, I think that I don't see any other questions. I might be, it's hard to scroll <laughs> and do this at the same time. But um, yeah, is there anything else that we haven't gotten to? Um, Here, I'm gonna drop, this is the larger um, yeah. page that we're still working on. This is still sort of the, bare bones of um, what we hope will become a very robust and exciting uh, web presence. Um, and we hope to digitize, as Marcy said, as much as possible, a lot of these resources um, related to the collection because you know this is one way that we can have um, a tremendous and large impact with this work is to be able to make it um, a accessible online. So uh, we're working on that. Yeah. Um... So in terms of, um, so yeah, so in terms of other questions about um, if you're a practicing Asian American artist, um, you know, Elisa and Mai's emails are, um, you know, publicly available, um, but the best way to reach us is probably there is um, an Asian American Art Initiative email. It's, I believe, Asian American Art Initiative at stanford.com um, or at stanford.edu. Um, you can also find it on the website. Um, and I think that um, that is either one of those are probably the best way to contact us. Um, you know, we've been, as you might imagine, kind of inundated with emails <laughs> since this has happened. So I'm sorry if there's a bit of a delay. Um, I'm sorry about that, but we'll, we'll try to get back to you. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. We wanna, we wanna hear from all of you and especially from the community members about the things um, you want and need. Um, and thank you, um, Mackenzie has actually uh, dropped the oh, link saving us email so we can send that. Um, and then in terms of uh, Yuri, um, my, dear, my dear colleague, um, asking about specific works favorites in the collection. Um, oh my gosh, there are just like so many. <laughs> I mean, I really like love that quail painting <laughs> that Elisa showed. I showed. love that quail painting so much too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, like the baby quails and the big quail. And it's just like, um, it's really, uh, it's by one of the, it's one of the first documented work, uh, works by a Japanese American, like a, a Japanese painter in the United States. Um, and so it's, it's really historically significant, but there's just like a lot of, um, I mean, it, it does something for me for landscape painting in terms of just like interrupting like the kind of majestic sweep into the landscape. And instead you've got all of these like little figures in the foreground. So, so yeah, I, li I like the quail painting. <laughs> what about you, Elisa? Honestly, I love that painting so much too for um, similar reasons. And even just like the photo that I showed was not a great photo. It was an iPhone photo. We are working on getting that professional photography. It's happening soon, but you know, these things are delayed in COVID, uh, but I couldn't help but share that. So yeah, I love the quail. I mean, I love that pair of the quail and the um, Toshio Aoki persimmons in an Indian basket, which again, I think very disruptive to the long history of still life painting. That pair just is, it's such a like beautiful pair. Um, but is actually quite a disruptive pair in, in terms of, you know, the narrative of American art with landscape painting and still life. 
Um, I love the historical material. And of course, like I have to be so excited about that Asawa wall because that, I mean, I know it's obvious, but you have to be so excited about that. Uh, and I, I can't wait just as much as everyone else to see everything up because it's never been installed anywhere in its entirety outside of her home. So this will be um, its forever home. And so I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Well, it's 628 right now. Um, and I think we've gotten to most of the questions. I'm sorry if um, my, my scrolling skills are <laughs> uh, in that I've missed um, one, but um, we just want to thank you all again for coming out. The turnout was like <laughs> way bigger than I thought it was going to be. I really like thought there were going to be like 20 people here. So it's <laughs> astounding that there were like almost 200. Um, and, and yeah, um, Elisa, do you have anything else? To oh say? yeah, thank you. Please sign up to be a part of the, um, the news, to receive our newsletter. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Marcy and I um, have our emails available, um, which we are inundated with, but of course uh, we remain forever interested. And um, thank you again. I really did not truly expect to see this many people as well. So this was really heartening. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care, bye everyone.